me when it's Maggie Bot, and uh, we are getting down to the wire. It is um, my top 100 games of all time, number 2311, and um, I'm really excited to get started on this list, and I don't really know what's on this section, except maybe I forgot another game. So this is going to be my top 102 games of all time, to all told. <laughs> um, but the other day, someone and I were talking about games that they would get rid of, so uh, a friend of mine went from owning like 500 games down to 25 and you know I'm looking at his 25 and one of them just peers out at me and I realized that I haven't mentioned it yet and I don't really recall making a slide for it and so at number 20.5 is St. Petersburg um, I probably will mention the second edition except I really like the art in the first edition but the second edition had these like module expansions built in and they were really, really good, especially in the market. And it helped like build out more strategies and stuff. So St. Petersburg, it's a two to five player game. Um, it was brought into the States by Z-Man, but it has like five million thousand publishers, Philosophia and a couple others. Um, basically it is a really nice light gateway level engine builder where players can buy cards and the players as a whole, as a whole meta, decide how long the game is going to be because as you leave card spots open, you deplete decks, and once a deck goes out, that's the end of the game. Um, it's a really hard one for new players to do well against experienced players, but I've still found it to be a really nice way of introducing people to Euros. Um, maybe if I had remembered it, it's probably true place in my whole top 100 is in the 40s somewhere. It would be higher if I owned a copy, probably, because it just never comes out. I'd rather play Glenmore because I have it, but whenever there's a St. Petersburg around, I will show it to someone because I think it's just so good and so perfect. Um, but now on to my proper list that I remembered to do before. <laughs> uh, number 20 is Rococo. This is a 2013 game from two to five players designed by Matthias Kramer as well as Louis Malls and Stefan Malls. Um, this was published by Eggert Spiel and brought into the States by uh, Eagle Griffin. Now, uh, Matthias Kramer is the designer of Glenmore, as I've talked about that before, and he's also done like, Kraftswagen. Um, the Malls brothers did Edo, which is kind of a funky little game, but Rococo is a mix of kind of action selection, a little bit of deck building, a little bit of area control, um, you will uh, get resources to make dresses and take those dresses and either just sell them off for cash or uh, put them into different halls in a big uh, delicious palace. And at the end of the game, you are going to see if you have the most dresses being worn in any given room. Um, you can also pay to put uh, to sponsor musicians or to build fountains. And um, it's just a really well done game that scales really beautifully from three to five is absolutely perfect two lacks a little something um the deck selection is probably the most unique part you have um the same deck every game and they go from like round one through round seven and um they all come out in slightly different order but you order the deck like round one round two round three round, round four and so on um, it, it's just so good the way that you have to make decisions. You're going to buy a card and you're going to put it in your hand. And so the longer you can go without having to, to cycle your hand, the better. But if you get it where you only have like three cards left in your hand, you don't get a choice the next round. And it's just, it's got all these really cool decisions within it. Um, it also, it, it becomes that scapegoat conversation piece with everyone when they're talking about um, girly themes and games. They'll mention how good the game of Rococo is, even though it has a girly theme. I, I don't know what to say about that, because it, it's a Euro, it feels like a Euro, and in general, those themes don't matter. <laughs> they can matter, and they can be problematic, and that will make me pay attention, but generally speaking, this is just a really good Euro game and so I wish it wasn't always the go-to whenever someone was talking about gender and gaming. <laughs> uh, next is 19 is Roads and Boats. Uh, this is a 1999 title. title. It's a one to four player game from Splatterspallen. Um, so 
Splatter games are these great takes. They, they take a mechanism and they completely put it on its head and you never quite know what you're going to get out of a splatter game, better or worse. They're not all for me. They're not all my favorites, but they are always something a little bit different. And what Rose and Boats is, um, it, it, from, I've only played it two to four players, but from two to four, you get a different size map and you can make it different shapes. And each player starts with a pretty humble little like donkey cart type engine and you can build up the different ways to move around on the roads. You can build different types of boats through the waters. Um, you have to build up processing wood and then making lumber. You have to make paper and research and make mints. Um, you find geese and then you carry them around until you can process them in different ways. And the, the fun part of Roads and Boats is that nothing is owned by a player necessarily. Like if I build a lumber manufacturer and it builds the lumber, someone else could walk along and take that lumber. And if I find a mine and that mine has some gold in it and I don't go take the gold myself, any other player could just wander up and take this gold I found. So it's a timing game, it's area control, but not because you can't actually control it. But you can make sure that you're within a number of spaces of the things that you need at the times that you need them. Um, this definitely is kind of a funky little game. You put the map down and you put an acrylic over it and you're drawing your little roads and you're making little marks everywhere and there's a million little chits in the game and the mines are these plastic bags that you <laughs> source your gold or whatever out of. Um, not the fanciest of games. That's not what Splatter is about. So if you're new to games in any way, and I don't know why you'd be watching this if you were, um, a Splatter game is $130, period. It might be higher than that if it's out of print, um, and your mileage may vary. I don't usually buy games when they're out of print, so I don't know prices. But just if you look at the components and you look at the back of the box, you're not going to get what you expect from like a Z-Man title or any, any, any other company at this point for the most part. You're going to get what they deliver. What they deliver are these small, very like concentrated couple of people who make incredible games. And so you have to figure out if that value is worth it to you. Because I've heard a lot of people say that they've bought a splatter game here or there for hundred something dollars and it wasn't worth it to them. And that's totally fine and valid. But for me, the enjoyment I get out of a splatter is much higher than a lot of other types of games. And so it is worth the dollars. Um, they tend to play a little longer, they tend to be a little crunchier, um, they just consistently make really cool, heavy games. So I, I know that, that people see that price tag and it's the first thing that they see because it's, it's how a lot of people decide on a game, but you definitely have to consider if you even want to go down that path and then you might consider that it generally holds that value. There's very few splatters you can get for a deal. Even the least expensive ones like Duck Dealer, you can still get at a pretty reasonable price. Um, so I, you can, you can get your value back out of it if you don't care for it, was what I'm saying. Like if you want to trade it away or sell it, you could likely get a good chunk of your money back out. So I encourage anyone who likes heavier titles or even medium weight titles to try some splatters. Roads and Boats I would put into the the heavier, more interactive category, but if you wanted something lighter, like a Great Zimbabwe, it would be just fine. Uh, number 18, uh, this is Niet. Uh, this was made in 1997. Um, I only tried it when Yellow redid it. This this used to be a little tiny orange box, but it, it's the same game. Um, this is a Stefan Dora game by Yellow, and it's two to five player trick-taking game. It says two to five on the BGG page, but then the yellow box says three to five. I probably wouldn't play this with fewer than three. So what this is, is a pretty straightforward trick taking game. I, I lead a suit. You have to follow if you can. If you don't have that, you can play whatever you like. If it's a Trump suit, it wins the trick. But here's the deal with Nyet is that you put out a little board at the beginning of the round and each player in succession gets to vote against things. So I can say, I don't want blue as the Trump. And you say, I don't want red as the Trump. And you say, I don't want, I want the, 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 the tricks to be worth not one point. And you say, I don't want them to be worth four points. 
and everyone goes around until there's only one possibility. So there's a first player, a trump, whether or not you get to discard cards, it's called a super trump, which are the, the ones of a given color, and um, how many points each trick is worth. And so you're watching what people are voting, and if you're voted the first player, then you get to assign who's on a team with each other based on what they set on that board. So that all sounds like a lot of stuff. If you don't play trick-taking games, this is maybe not the one to start on. Just start on like a diamonds or a spades. Play some Ohel and have some fun. But um, this is definitely for people who know how trick-taking works. Um, so you assign the teams and then your tricks go into like a combined score. So if the tricks are worth negative one point each, you want to slough off as many as possible so you don't take tricks for your team. Um, what's also fun is that in each suit, it would be normal deck of cards, except each suit has three of the number one, three copies of it. And if you control number ones from players not on your team, they're basically worth a trick. So in negative point hands, that can be huge. In a positive point hands, that can be huge. And each trick could be worth up to four points. So huge, swingy, crazy scores. Um, I really like the as, as you can tell, um, I have played it quite a bit. Um, I've only had kind of one negative experience with it, but again, it was with someone who just didn't quite understand trick taking at all. And so the decisions they were making and the teams they were creating were not born out of a knowledge of what that might mean. Uh, and that makes this game a little frustrating for me. Uh, number 17 is Adeline. Uh, this is a 2000 title from Rainer Knizia for two players. Uh, this one's published by GMT. There's also a version called Shot and Totten, which was the original name of it. But the new Shot and Totten from Yellow has the same rules as Battle Line because um, the original didn't have these little tactics cards that are in the in the current version. So this is a um, you put flags out in the middle of the row and you need to break through by either getting three flags in a row or five flags total, one onto your side. And what you do is you just play a card and draw a card every turn and your cards can be in sets and they're scored similar to poker hands where if I have like a, a sequence of the same color or if I have three of the same color, I have um, a sequence, all of those are uh, uh, better or worse based on kind of poker hands. And so um, it's a really interesting kind of almost bluffing a little bit, a little bit of math, a little bit of luck. And then there are these special tactics cards that if you play them onto a line that hasn't been claimed, then you can change the rule of that line. You can say, well, this one wants the lowest possible score or whatever. Um, it's a really interesting two player game. It's one that uh, doesn't take up a lot of room and you can play with pretty much anyone and have a good time as long as they like a little bit of tug of war. Um, it's certainly not low conflict, but it's a really, really good time. Uh, number 16. And this feels a little high for Deluvia Project, but I honestly just, it's something about this game that just gets me. So Deluvia Project was a 2015 title from Spillworks. It plays two to four players. The art is absolutely gorgeous. I, I dare say this might be my favorite art in a game, period. Um, this is the same artist that does things like power grid. So he works on all these really beautiful greens. Green happens to be my favorite color. And so um, in Deluvia Project, you have two kind of sections. You have kind of a turn bid section that works a little like the Targi grid or Ulm or any of these little like grid action selection games. And then you have a worker placement side of it where the more workers you place on an action, the stronger the action is. So it's combining two of these mechanisms I absolutely love into one thing. So um, you start out by bidding on these tiles and kind of having to pay for them, taking those and they give you resources or, or different actions. And then after everyone's expended their, their blimps on that, you go through and you put your workers down to kind of build out into the city in the clouds. And we've got area control. And um, one other thing I really like about this one that not a lot of games do is that you have um, kind of incomes. You have like points incomes and cube incomes and all these other things. And so you have to work on that a little bit. It's almost, almost feels like a tech tree. Um, and it has these like, temporary points that give you real points and um, so it's confusing and hard to teach and I maybe played the longest game of Deluvia Project ever at BGGCon one year 
I invited um, my friend Lance, who's fabulous, to come and sit down and play a game of Delivia Project. But unfortunately, Lance is a very popular guy. So every four minutes, someone came up to give him a hug and say hello and kind of shoot the shit. And unfortunately, our game dragged on. This should be a two to three hour game, but it was probably four and a half hours, maybe longer. So I don't know that I did justice in that game for it, but all the other games so far that I've played of it have been really good. And it does work at the two player level okay. It works much better at three, but uh, the two player is pretty fun. It's just the action control, area control that doesn't really work at two. Uh, next is Go See. Uh, so this is a 2010 card game from Kim Sato. Uh, published by Moonster Games, which is two to four players. Uh, Moonster is a French company with like a lot of Korean influences, so I don't know kind of their history or anything, but so far they've released a couple other games, a Choreo and Shozan, um, but I didn't really care for any of them. They did have a little kind of, it was like a roll and write, but it was like a draw tiles out of a bag and write <laughs> called Streams. That was pretty fun. Um, reminds me of like Rolling Japan. Uh, so Gosu, how to describe it? It's a 100 card deck in which 60 of the cards are unique and 40 have some repeats in them. And what you're doing is building up a tableau of goblins to build an army. And so the goblins have like level 1, level 2, level 3. And you win if you get to certain thresholds on your turn or if you play a card that has a win condition and then you meet that condition. It's a very, like, build up your things and blow up the other people's things kind of game. And you do much better in this game the better you know it. So, unfortunately, teaching this game to new players can be a little bit brutal if you've played a lot of it. Um, so that goes into why I very rarely play Ghost Suit, but I love it. Um, this was also one of the first games I learned, so some of the sentimental thing is here as well. Um, the art is zany. It's a lot of different goblins, and they're all, like, there's one faction that's all shadowy, so they have all these beautiful shadowy goblins, and one that's, like, on fire, and so they're all fiery and cool. Um, I don't know. It, it's very charming to me, and I still really like the gameplay. I think I like it a little bit better at two or three players. Uh, at four, it can feel a little more random, just so much time in between when you're taking actions someone i feel like someone can run away with it uh, next is number 14 this is another splatter title called greed inc from 2009 this one's a three to five player greed game uh, so uh this one's theme is probably the least pc one that i have on this list but in a way i don't mind it's got kind of that wall street theme um, so what you want to do is control uh, corporations, get fast cars and women and, and jewelry and all these like trappings, luxury items. Uh, so in, at the end of the day, your money doesn't matter. The companies, your van didn't matter. It's what you got out of the game that mattered. Um, but you do this in a really fantastic way. So everyone's going to have these corporations and um, the corporation itself is going to have um, holdings. And those holdings produce resources or take resources and make them secondary resources. Um, but once you've kind of done your initial thing, all the corporations can trade with one another. So if I produce blue and you can make blue into two green, I could trade you a blue and then we could both take a green or whatever it is. There's like a minimum uh, trade value, but you can trade favors, you can trade machines, you can do whatever you want. And you also are going to bid on being in the places of the different corporations. So I want to be the CEO, the COO, whatever. Um, then at some point you check and whether a corporation made more money this turn than they did last turn. If they did, the money shifts over and you've got like available cash for your company. Um, if it didn't, if your corporation made fewer dollars this year than last year, then you're going to kind of vote on who to kick out of that corporation, um, kick them out and give them half of that profit on their way out called their golden parachute. Uh, the corporation then goes to whoever was next on the board or whatever. Um, so as a player, you could end up controlling multiple corporations, but all that cash that you get on the way out is your personal cash and that's how you buy the item. So that's the only way to get 
personal funds in the game and that's how you win because every every round or big phase you get to bid on buying one item and there's only so many items in the game and you know i i know that it can be a little bit brutal it does have sort of a you you could lose control of all corporations for a couple rounds and then have to come back once you get voted into the CEO spot in another one. So you can't just leave if you're out of the game. You just have to you have to make sure that you never get completely ousted from all your corporations. It's tricky. Number 13, it's Haunted Titanica. This is a 2009 title from Andrea Stedding, plays two to five players, and is published by Argentum Verlag. Now, I say two to five, but in reality, I mean three to five. There is a two-player variant in the base box that doesn't work at all and there are future maps that you can buy that work better at two players but the base game itself best at four and boy howdy is this a cool game it's kind of a bloodbath it's um you all turn into vultures circling around waiting to pick at the remains of your opponents or make them kick you out of all the spaces they want to be in and it's incredibly brutal, and it was one of the first games I ever learned, and I've loved it for many years now. I think I did buy it in 2010, so really one of the first games I, I ever played. Um, this game has zero randomness with the exception of small bonus tokens that you draw during the game. Um, that being said, it doesn't feel dry. It's a very interactive game, especially for a Euro, as you're trying to claim these routes and people can pay extra resources, kick you out and take your spot. And so you're trying to claim offices to get points, but you also want to claim um, action roads to get better actions over time. Um, really, I it's hard for me to describe how much I love this game, but it it is one to this day I, I never get tired of. Um, and JS Studying makes really interesting decisions happen. <laughs> Uh, there is kind of a bloodbath element down near where you can pick up extra actions every round, but I've definitely survived without having to compete in that area as much. And when you play in three players, it's not as bad. Uh, number 12 is Macau. <laughs> Back on my Stefan Feld counter. <laughs> uh, Macau is a 2009 title from Feld and Aaliyah Robinsberger and Rio Grande. Um, this is a two to four player game in which you have this fabulous Windrose mechanism. And it is the reason this game is good. Um, each turn you're going to roll some dice for like the central pool. Everyone's going to claim some of those dice to, um, put out colored cubes. So if I pick the black six and the red three, I get six black cubes on the number six and three red cubes on the number three. And that tells you that in three turns, you're going to have three red cubes. <laughs> That's all really confusing in that visuals. But um, what's nice about that is that as you go and as you take different turns and you're claiming new dice, you're constantly adding to the same pools with different colors of dice. So every turn, you're going to have these cool combinations of colors of cubes. And that tells you what cards you can purchase and what actions you can take. The actions you can take are either taking over parts of the city moving your boat around or buying cards. And if you don't keep up with buying cards, you are going to lose the game. Uh, it's brutal, it's hard, it's interactive, and it's so felt it hurts, and it's one of the best. Um, it 100% needs a reprint, but in order to do that, it 100% needs new art. Uh, the colorblind factor in this game is absolutely ridiculous. You cannot play this if you can't determine the different colors. And the art on the cards is confusing and not exciting. So I, I hope one day that this comes back into print because it is a gem. It is a gem to say the least. And I've been seeing online these little wooden wind roses that people are making that I really, really want at this point. So I'm going to have to source one of those here. All right, last one for today. Number 11 is <laughs> Innovation. It's a 2010 game um, from Carl Chudik. So it's two to four players, and it's still to this day published by Asmati Games. Uh, Yellow Games also has a version of this with this funky art, but Innovation itself has this very stoic looking kind of monochromatic uh, art that I, I really quite like. Um, I remember the first time I played Innovation, it was the same day as I played Dominant Species for the first time, and um, I just remember 
learning the game and you're, you're going through and you're building these combos out and the cards are, you know, one card activating it can change the entire board state. And I was thinking, how am I ever going to get my head wrapped around this game? But as you play and as you learn it and the more times you play it, the more sense everything makes. And I know that in, you know, round four or five, I'm going to have you know, coal and gunpowder coming out. So I need to prepare for that. And if someone, you know, hits really lucky with X card or Y card, they're going to do really well. So I have to watch out for that. And there's ways of burying a card you don't like or trying to manipulate the cards you do have. Um, it has gotten to the point where I can't even teach this game anymore because I've played so much of it that no one wants to play against me. So I need to teach two people that aren't playing against me so they can have fun and then invite them into their sixth game with me. <laughs> um, I'm seeing pictures of Innovation Deluxe around the internet a couple of days ago, and I'm really excited to see what that looks like in my hot little hands. But that's it for me for now. If you're enjoying these videos, please um, subscribe or like or whatever. And if you're not, you can still do that. I don't care. <laughs> um, but if you'd like to tell me some more about your favorite games, leave a comment below. And if you don't want to do any of that, that's cool too. I've got these chocolate covered raisins. That seems like a thing to do too. Thanks everybody. I'll see you next time for more top 10.